As we saw last time in Exodus chapter 1, uh, life for the Jewish people in Egypt has definitely taken a brutal, harsh turn for the worse. Uh, the Jewish population has grown tremendously in Egypt. They started off with 70 that came down when Joseph was there already, and God sent him there to prepare the way to you know, save the nation from the drought especially. Um, and then his family comes down, and so they start off with 70, and now there are about 2 million Jews living in Egypt at this time, and their population is pretty close to the same size as the Egyptian population. And because of this, Pharaoh Thutmose I, uh, he is getting worried about the Jewish people. He's thinking if Egypt is ever attacked again, then the Jews might side with uh, their enemies and join them. And so he really turns the Jewish people into slaves, literally. Uh, he treated them harshly. He treated them brutally. He tried to demoralize them by, uh, you know, just working them to the point of exhaustion. But as we saw in chapter 1, his plan backfired. It says the Jewish people kept growing in number and in might. And, and so it took uh, a little bit longer, but then he took further steps to try to come against the Jewish people. We saw that he orders uh, the Hebrew midwives... Uh, Shipra, who means beauty, and Pua, who means splendor. And he orders them to have all their midwives kill every Jewish baby boy as soon as it is born. But as we saw, these two brave women, they defied. Uh, they, you know, in a sense, as a first instance of civil disobedience in the scriptures, they defied the king's orders. And they refused to kill the, the Jewish baby boys. They kind of drug their heels. Uh, they tell them, wow, they're just having babies so fast. They have a baby before we can get there. And so it says God blessed them. He gave them families of their own. And, and so when uh, Pharaoh sees that, he takes it a step further. And then he orders his Egyptian citizens to spy on the Jews and then when they see a baby boy born to the Jews he says you now take those babies and throw them in the Nile River and kill them and so it's just a brutal time at this point in history for the Jewish people this is the situation as we come into uh, Exodus chapter 2 and in a moment we'll look at the birth of Moses now, in this chapter, we will see the invisible hand of God on full display, otherwise known as the providence of God. Uh, it simply means that God is sovereign. Uh, we should believe as Christians that God is in control of everything, everything in this universe, everything that's going on in the world around us. He wants to be in control of our lives, but that's where we need to submit ourselves to him. But at the same time as Christians, we know that God is love, and he loves you, he loves your family, he has a, a wonderful plan for each and every one of us. Again, we see this very clearly in this chapter. Uh, we'll see the providence of God in action in the life of this young Jewish family, and uh, with their third-born child, as we'll see in a moment. Now, providence, it comes from the Latin word provideo. It looks like provideo when you look at it. Provideo, it simply means to see ahead, and in light of what you see, you plan ahead. Well, that's simply what sovereignty means. God sees all, God knows all, he's omniscient, and because he is, he knows exactly how everything's going to turn out. And he steers us in the direction that he wants us to go. But here's a key point. It's always in the direction that he knows is best for us. And uh, if we don't follow his path that he has for us, then we'll find ourselves fighting against his will. And we'll find ourselves stumbling and bumbling along in this life because we're living contrary to his word and his will and his ways for us. Um, as a Christian, if you continually disobey the Lord, you'll find yourself grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. 
That's what Paul tells us. And so the remedy is humble yourself before the Lord, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you all of, of all unrighteousness. You repent. You stop doing what your flesh says, and you start doing things God's way. And then you get back in line with what He has planned for your life. This is true not only for us as individuals, but this is true in how we should raise our families. Now, as a Christian, my philosophy has always been with my wife, Elizabeth, that John... I guess was complimenting on her bowling techniques. Um, but with her, first and foremost, she is God's daughter. And so that means I need to show her love, respect. I, ne I need to show kindness. Uh, I need to have compassion. I need to be gracious. Uh, the same is true with our children. Our two daughters, they're on loan. We're on loan to us from God. Uh, we were in charge of raising them in the admonition, in the love, the ways of God, and that's important. They are God's kids first and foremost. For me as a pastor, this is true as well. You're not my sheep. You are God's flock. We all are sheep to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And so I want to feed, I want to tend his flock with the nourishment of God's word, and in the love of the Holy Spirit, that's the same thing Jesus told Peter. If you love me, Peter, then feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. You know, that's the, the biggest requirement for any church leader. Now, parenting today has got to be one of the most challenging things ever. I mean, our society is attacking children like never before, whether it's our government, whether it's our schools, whether it's our libraries. Children are under assault, especially all the garbage on the internet. Your children, our grandchildren, are being assaulted from every direction, every day. But at the same time, raising children in the ways of the Lord, it's got to be one of the greatest blessings, one of the greatest achievements there is in this life. And as most of you know, having little ones around the house is never dull. It's like the story of the little boy. He was upstairs, and he starts screaming out for his mom. Mom, mom, come quickly. And so she runs upstairs, and it's like, son, what's going on? What's the matter? Are you okay? She goes, yes, I dropped my toothbrush in this yucky toilet, and I can't get it out. So she puts on a rubber glove and gets it out of the yucky toilet and throws it in the trash. And he looks at her and is like, oh. And so he reaches over the counter. He grabs her toothbrush and throws it in the trash. And it's like, why are you throwing my toothbrush in the trash? Because last week your toothbrush fell in the yucky toilet. So, kids are awesome, aren't they? And even though we might not see how in the world God is going to use that little boy or that little girl in the future, God has an amazing plan for them if they will learn to trust Jesus with their life, knowing that he loves them so much. Paul says it like this, Ephesians 1, starting in verse 11, it says, In him, it's in Jesus, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that's God's providence, that we who first trusted in Christ should be, of this, uh, should be to the praise of his glory, and then he says, in him, in Christ, you also trusted. So God is sovereign, but he's given us a free will. God in his sovereignty created us with a free will, so you have to trust. You have to believe. And so it says, in him you also trusted. When? After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, so that's our responsibility, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so that means God has always got a good plan for us. Uh, eventually God wins out, and so it's better for us to submit our ways to Him and not fight against Him. Now today in our world there are a lot of crazy, scary things going on. Uh, war is happening. More wars are on the horizon. What's happening in Ukraine just doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon. The Middle East is a powder keg. Uh, the nations around Israel, especially Iran, uh, want to annihilate the Jewish people. They've 
for years have said we want to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. They're little Satan, the U.S. is big Satan. They want to destroy us. And our silly government keeps giving billions of dollars to the Iranians for whatever reason. And they're using the money not for humanitarian reasons, but to build nuclear weapons. Israel knows they are, and it could be any moment where Israel will say, okay, enough is enough. We're going to go in there. Because last week, Iran was boasting, we have a missile that can arrive in uh, Tel Aviv, and it was just like 40-something seconds. I mean, very short notice. They say it'll penetrate the Iron Dome that the, the Jews have. So we're living in crazy times. Immorality, wickedness, violence. It's growing like crazy. But for us who believe in the Bible, we know that all these things were prophesied about in the scriptures from the very beginning. God knows the end from the beginning. And what we have been saying for the last few years is things in this world are not falling apart. Things in this world are falling into place, exactly as God, God's word lines out for us. And so Exodus chapter 2 it reminds us that even though God may be silent, even though God may be invisible, and he may take years to work out his plans, and even if hard things come into our lives in the meantime, never forget God is in charge. He is sovereign, and he will eventually fulfill every aspect of his word. So with that in mind, look at chapter 2, and we'll pick up in verse 1. It says, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived, and we'll find out this is their third child, and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Now remember, this is right at the height of when Pharaoh says, Kill all baby Jewish boys. Now, we know this is at the beginning of this Egyptian mandate because we'll see that uh, baby Moses has a three-year-old brother named Aaron, uh, a six -year -old, about a six-year-old sister named Miriam. In chapter 6, verse 20, we'll see that Moses' dad was named Amram, and his mother's name is Jochebed. Notice it says they're from the tribe of Levi. That would be the spiritual tribe over the nation of Israel. So Moses had Levi genes. One, two, three, four. I know. Like I said, first service, when I wrote that down, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. But I usually just go with my gut. The main point is, this was a really tough time to raise a family in Egypt. Amram was a mistreated government employee. Think about it. He was literally a slave to Egypt. And I hear a lot of people today, especially a lot of young people today, say things like, well, I don't want to have children now. The world is such a mess. Besides, Jesus is coming back soon. Jesus can certainly come back at any moment for his bride. But I remember sitting in church, Calvary Chapel, San Diego, 43 years ago. Elizabeth and I just found out she was pregnant. And our pastor, Mike, was uh, saying, you know what? For any of you that have little kids, we won't be around much longer. You probably will not even be raising teenagers. Well, I'm still irritated about that one. God's mandate of getting married, having children, hasn't changed. Besides, if Christians stopped having babies, where would the next Moses come from? Think about it. Where would the next Christian teacher or doctor or nurse or missionary or church leader come from? The church is to be the pillar and foundation of truth. But the Lord's church is made up of men and women, boys and girls, and the family unit is still very precious in God's eyes. And even in the most difficult times, like Egypt with the Jews, a lot worse than it is here, but they were still going to do what God called them to do. And so God is always with his people. Now, in Jochebed, it says, you know, she looks at her newborn son, she sees him as a beautiful baby. 
You know, that's pretty much what every mom sees when they have a baby. Oh, that baby is so beautiful. I've been at a lot of births, and I'm like, really? I don't know. Okay, I'm glad you think that baby's beautiful. Like baby Yoda to me, but that's okay. <laughs> this word beautiful means striking or robust or healthy. Uh, I think that by faith, Jochebed knew that there's something special about this baby. In fact, in Hebrews 11, verse 23, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And in the Greek, it means no ordinary child. Not pretty, but he's just no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. Again, I wish all parents saw their children that way, not as a burden, but as a blessing, not as a problem or that child's pathetic, but that they would see, no, there's a lot of potential here because this is God's children. This is God's child. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, many of you that have large families know this verse. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak, in, uh, speak with their enemies in the gate. So the imagery in that psalm is that as a parent, as you raise your children in the ways of the Lord, they become arrows, they become weapons for the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. And so that's why we raise them up in the ways of the Lord. So pray for your children, pray for your grandkids, pray for the children in our Sunday school, pray for the youth group and their leaders next door. Only God knows who might be in there. You know, you look in there, I look in the youth room and I'm like, really, Lord, there's another Moses in here? Another Elijah? I know some of these kids, I don't know. But God sees he sees the end from the beginning. We look with our natural eyes. Oh, man. But God sees the next Jochebed, Deborah, or Esther for a time such as this. We don't know, but God does know. And so the admonition for us, raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Well, look at verse 3. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. Now, this is an amazing verse here because, first of all, Moses' parents have done everything possible for three months to keep him safe, but now they can't hide him any longer. Maybe, you know, some of the Egyptian neighbors know, oh, they got a baby boy, we're going to report it, we're going to have him thrown in the river, and so time is up. And so in desperation, Jochebed makes... It says a little ark here. It's like a little boat, a basket out of bulrushes, which is just a reed that grows along the banks of the Nile River. And she probably weaved it into a basket, put pitch, asphalt, you know, like tar around it, probably in it to keep it waterproof. Three times the word ark is used in Genesis and in Exodus. That's the only time in the Bible really it mentions these three arks. The Ark of Noah, gopher wood, and they covered it with what? Pitch, asphalt, same as this. This little ark, this little basket, and then we'll see later on in Exodus, the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant? It was acacia wood, named after our granddaughter. No, our granddaughter named after that acacia wood. The wood's plain, but it was covered with pure gold. That's what made the ark so special. It was placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later in the temple. But the most amazing part of this verse is that Jochebed places her baby in this little ark, sets it in the reeds by the banks of the river, the Nile River. And so technically she's obeying the mandate, got to throw that baby in the river, but... You know, that's what the law said, but what she did showed tremendous faith and tremendous hope because she's literally surrendering her son completely over to God. I mean, can you imagine the pain that was in her heart, just surrendering her baby, this beautiful baby, in this little basket, setting it in the reeds? All she could do was just say, okay, Lord, he belongs to you. I've done all that I can do. 
Now, I know some of you parents have had to do this with your own children. By faith, you may have given up your child for adoption, or you have adopted by faith someone's baby. By faith, you know this person needs the proper care. Some of you have had to do this with your grown children. There comes a point in time when you can no longer enable them, but you got to surrender them to the Lord, and they need to start trusting the Lord for themselves. So she lays him in the reeds by the river's bank. Look at verse 4. And his sister, this is a little six-year-old Miriam, stood afar off to know what would be done to him. So she's watching from a distance. You know, what's going to happen to my baby brother? Is it going to sink and he'll drown in the river? Is the current going to pull him out and just wash him down the river? I mean, she is just curious. She just wants to know. Her heart is crying out for her little brother. Well, you already know of the answer. What does God do? This is God's providence in action. Verse 5. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Again, another amazing scene here. It just so happens that Pharaoh's daughter and her maidens just happen to be walking by the river's edge here at this moment, and they see this basket. The Hebrews have an old saying that says, Coincidence is not a kosher word. And that's so true. Here's a great example of it. This Egyptian princess, she sees the little ark. Notice she opens the lid, and the baby begins to cry. And that cry just moved her. It must have moved her with compassion for this little Hebrew boy. She recognized this is one of the Hebrews' children. She may have been moved with compassion because she realized, man, this is the desperate act of a loving Hebrew mom. And this is her way of trying to protect this little baby boy. Somehow God attaches this princess, her heart, to this little baby. One commentator says, In that cry was the future plan of God for the nation of Israel. Another said, God used a baby's tears to control the heart of a powerful princess. And so with this one little cry from this helpless Jewish baby, would set in motion God's plan of deliverance for the Jewish people, but also God's plan of deliverance for the human race, because down the line, because the Jews would survive, because Moses would deliver them, God would use him, and they would survive. They wouldn't be annihilated like the enemy wanted. And then through their lineage, through the tribe of Judah, would come the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. So from this little cry, pretty amazing, You've probably heard the statement, the devil is in the details. That's really not true. God is in the details. You know, God works all things together for good to those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. This gets even better. Look at verse 7. Then his sister, so here's Miriam, six years old, said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse a child for you? I mean, she's been watching his head from a distance. Now she sees her little baby brother scooped out of the water. They open the lid. They see the baby, and she gets all excited. She goes running up to him just boldly. You want me to find someone who can nurse this baby for you among the Hebrews? And look at verse 8. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. I mean, the princess thinks, that's a great idea. Go find someone that can do this. So Miriam runs home to tell her mom, and, and I can just imagine, Mom, you're not going to believe what happened. Our baby brother, my baby brother, he got scooped up by the princess, Pharaoh's daughter. And now she wants me to find somebody that can nurse him. Mom, <laughs> that's you. So the, both of them go. Back to Pharaoh's daughter. Look at verse 9. gets even better. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. 
So the woman took the child and nursed him. Again, under the circumstances, this could not have turned out any better for Jochebed. She gets to take her own baby home, gets to nurse him, raise him for probably three to four years. That's how long they would nurse the child back then. And on top of that, the Egyptian government's going to pay for it. I mean, this is unbelievable. I mean, is God amazing or what? He has every detail lined up perfectly. Someone once said, God is like the ultimate chess player. He, he is so many moves ahead that while you're still putting your pawns on the chessboard, God says, checkmate. And it's true. Imagine Jochebed sitting in her home nursing baby Moses when Amram comes home after a long day, literally slaving away in the fields. And he's like, oh, I got to tell you about the day I had. Oh, sit down, honey. I got to tell you about the day we've had. And here's our baby. He's still here. And the government's paying us. Oh, crazy. I bet from this point on, they looked at Moses in a whole new way. Uh, I wonder how God... He's going to use this little guy. I wonder what he's got in store for our little boy here. He must have something very special for him in the future. So by faith, they're raising him up in the ways of the Lord. Look at verse 10. And the child grew. So he's no longer a baby. Now he's a child. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. So she called his name Moses. We don't know what the parents called him. But it's the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, who names him Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. And that's what Moses means, one who's drawn out. So he was drawn out of the water by her. In many ways, it must have been heart-wrenching to have, you know, Jochebed having to surrender baby Moses to Pharaoh's daughter. But at the same time, I'm sure their faith, their trust in the Lord must have grown a lot during those years. But like any believing parent, there comes a time when we need to let go. We need to let go of our children. We need to trust that God is going to finish what he started in their lives. Again, our daughters were given to us on loan by God. We are to be good stewards over them. So we're done. Now it's up to them to raise their kids in the ways of the Lord. As grandparents, we just get to sit back and have fun. We can spoil them. We can just send them home with chocolate and ice cream in their bellies, and it's okay. We're done. But no, we want to raise them in the ways of the Lord. But even though they may have had Moses for just three or four years, I'm pretty confident they took that time with him just to talk to him, as you would in the Sunday school class with little guys. God loves you. God created you. God's the creator of the heavens and the earth. God's the one that brought a flood into this world through, you know, during Noah's time. Probably taught him all about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob's son Joseph. Why are we in Egypt? Because Jacob's son Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt. But God raised him up. I mean, sure, they told him as much as they could. And we'll find out. Moses knew he was a Hebrew all along. He was raised as an Egyptian, but... He always knew that he was a Jewish man. Now, before we look at verse 11, let me just say this about Moses' life. Uh, you can divide his life into three segments, 40 years each segment. The first 40 years, we're reading here. He was raised in the ways of Egypt. The next 40 years, he'll be in the wilderness. The final 40 years, he'll be used as the deliverer. But again, the first 40 years, what we're looking at right here, and after he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, he was trained, he was educated in the ways of Egypt. Now, when you think of Egypt, think of the world, because when you read about Egypt, you read about Babylon, spiritually, they always represent the corrupt world that we're living in. But we read in uh, Acts 7.22, it says, And Moses was learned... In all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and it was mighty in words and deeds. That word mighty means mighty in battle. Many believe that Moses was a warrior, uh, maybe like a general in the army for the Egyptians. History tells us the Egyptians were highly developed in their civilization, especially in engineering. I mean, you think of the pyramids, especially in mathematics. Um, people still marvel at how they 
would you know, mummify bodies and that they would survive for thousands of years. Astronomy was a big thing with the Egyptians. So during his first 40 years, Moses thought he was something special. As we'll see in a moment, the next 40 years, he's going to realize he's nothing without God. But then the last 40 years, we're going to see that Moses will come to realize that there's really only one who is truly special, and that's the Lord himself. And he is going to use Moses in tremendous ways. So look at verse um, 11. From verses 10 to 11, we jump ahead now 40 years. Verse 11 says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. So again, one of his brethren, he knows, he's, a, he's Jewish, so he looked this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So here we see Moses taking a stand. We, we see Moses, he didn't like bullies. We'll see that, through that throughout this section. Here he sees an Egyptian bullying a Jewish man, and so he strikes down this Egyptian. In Acts 7.25, we're given this insight. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So he's taking this stand for the Jewish people. He thinks, I'm going to be their deliverer. And yet he's doing this in his own strength. He wrongly thought, I've got a, a high government position here. You know, he, some are saying he might have been groomed to be the next pharaoh because princess of pharaoh, the, the daughter, probably didn't have another son. That's what some historians say. Be that as it may, he's thinking, I'm going to use my position, my government authority to deliver the Jewish brethren, and so he strikes down. I don't know what he's thinking. I'm going to do this one Egyptian at a time? Strike down two million Egyptians. I don't know what he was thinking, but verse 12 is very telling here. Notice, he looked this way and that way and then killed the Egyptian. See the problem? He didn't look up. He looked this way, looked that way, but he didn't look up. He didn't look to the Lord. So even though he knew his calling, that God was going to use him to deliver the Jews, Moses acts out in the flesh, and the results were disastrous. How many times, and I know I've done it many times, but how many times do we know the right thing to do, but instead of waiting on the Lord, seeking His will, we just jump right in and we make something happen, and it falls flat. And so before we do anything to supposedly help God out, we need to look up and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do this? In other words, using fleshly means to try and accomplish a spiritual task never works. It might look like it works on the surface, but it never works in God's eyes. It never brings glory to the Lord. Well, look at verse 13. And he went out the second day. Behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? So again, we see him standing up for the weaker one. He doesn't like bullies. Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of, his, uh, of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So he's feeling pretty good about himself. I struck down the Egyptian. I buried him. Got away with that one. Now he's standing up for the Jew, and he's standing up against the bully Jew, and now he says, oh, you're going to kill me too? Oh, no. If Pharaoh finds out, I'm in trouble. Well, Pharaoh did find out. He's in trouble. He wants to kill him. So he flees. He flees to Midian. Where's Midian? It's east of the Sinai Peninsula. It's in present day, it would be western side of Saudi Arabia, out in the middle of nowhere. He's in Midian. Who are the Midianites? Well, they're distant relatives of the Jews. Remember when Abraham and Sarah, they had uh, Isaac, 
And then Sarah dies, and so who does Abraham marry? Keturah. And they have a few kids. One of the kids they have is named Midian. And so he is the head of the Midianites. So they're cousins, you might say, of the Jewish people. So Moses flees. He sits down, notice, by a well. So that means he's tired. He's thirsty. He's just hanging out there because it's a long way from where he was in Goshen over to Midian. Look at this psalm, Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, Be still and know that I am God. This is when God's going to start to work in Moses' life. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And again, that's what Moses will discover while being still in Midian. He's left everything behind in Egypt. He had worldly wealth, possessions. He had it all. And now he's on the backside of the desert, really with nothing. So now Moses enters the school of hard knocks, but this is exactly where God wants him to be. This is where he'll spend the next 40 years of his life, and God is going to teach him how to be a servant leader, how to be a shepherd for God's people. He didn't want him being like Pharaoh, lording it over his people. He wanted him to be a servant shepherd, a servant leader. God doesn't want human dictators. God wants people submitted to the chief shepherd, Jesus. Verse 16, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came, these, you might say, bad shepherds, they came and drove the, the, the women, these ladies, away. They drove, drove them away, but Moses, here he is standing up for the weak, doesn't like bullies, he stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So Moses comes against these false shepherds. This is the first act of God um, teaching him, you know, working on him in this foreign land. He comes out against the false shepherds, those who don't care about God's flock. Verse 18 when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. So he's probably still dressed in his Egyptian garb. He doesn't look, you know, Hebrew. He looks like an Egyptian. Maybe talk like an Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian, or whatever, you know. I don't I never liked that song. Um... They said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have not, uh, you've left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. So a couple things going on here. Here's Ruel. His name means, in Hebrew, friend of God. The Greek word for friend of God is Theophilus. Remember when uh, Luke, Dr. Luke writes his letter, the Gospel of Luke, then he writes the book of Acts. Both of them start with, you know, introduction to Theophilus, my beloved friend Theophilus, a lover of God. That's who Ruel is. His name, we'll find out in chapter 3, is also named Jethro. He's got a couple different names. But be that as it may, Jethro, Ruel, He's got seven unmarried daughters who are, you know, filling the trough. They're helped out by this man, Moses, 40 years old. And so he's like, okay, you got a guy that helped you. He's single. You, none of you are married. Where is he? Why'd you leave him behind? Go get him. Does he still have breath? Does he still walk? Uh, you know, bring him here. And so they run. They bring Moses back to Jethro's home. Well, look at verse 21. And Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses. And she bore him a son. So this is going into the future a little bit. He called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. So what we just read here covers the next 40 years of his life. We'll pick up next time, Lord willing, in verse 23, and that'll start the third phase when he's 80 years old. 
But I just want to close with a few important points here that we see in this section. Notice again in verse 21, and Moses was content. Probably the first time in his life that he was content. He grew up with the wealth of Egypt. He had it made in the shade. He probably drove the nicest of chariots. He had the beamer chariot. You know, he had the best of everything. Yet now, he's content with nothing except for the clothes on his back. He didn't bring chariots full of stuff with him when he left Egypt. He's there. He's running for his life. But now he is content. This is important. All the wealth of this world will not make you content. Jesus said to the woman at the well, you know, you can drink of this well water, but guess what? You'll be thirsty again. But I have water that if you'll drink from what I have for you, you'll never thirst again. It'll become in you a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life, the rivers of living water that Jesus offers. Here he finds contentment. 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. You never see a hearse going down the street pulling a U-Haul. Doesn't happen. So we see Moses is content. What else do we see here? Moses marries a Gentile bride. And it's interesting because Moses is a type of Jesus. There's some parallels there. So Moses, the first time, wants to deliver his own people, but they reject him. And so he goes and marries a Gentile bride. When Moses comes back, they'll receive him the second time. Stephen talks about this also in Acts chapter 7. But the same thing with Jesus. He came to his own, John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So Jesus, in a sense, left, and we are his Gentile bride, made up of Jews, you know, Gentiles, from every tribe, tongue, nation, people. We're the bride of Christ. When he comes at his second coming, Every Jew that survives the Great Tribulation, every Jew will receive him as Lord and Savior. We have the, his word. We just saw it in Revelation, Revelation 1-7. Uh, you know, he's coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. It says there in uh, Zechariah 12-10, when he comes back, every uh, mother they'll mourn for him as a mother mourns for her only son. They'll ask him, where did you get those wounds in your hands? In the house of my friends. And then every Jew alive will receive him at his second coming. And so he's married to us, but he's not done with the Jewish people yet. The third thing here, and I'll close with this, he names his firstborn son strangers living in a foreign land, Gershom. That's exactly what we are. We're strangers and aliens just passing through. We're in a strange land, planet Earth. Our real home, it's in heaven. You might have an earthly address. You know, we have dual citizenship, or you have an earthly address, but our real address, our forever address, 777 Pearly Gateway. I'm just kidding, but, you know, whatever it is, you know, that's our heavenly address. Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So I can't wait. He's going to transform this lowly body. And you might be young thinking, my body's in great shape. Eh, give it a few years, and you'll see it getting lower and lower. It's a lowly body, but Jesus has a new body awaiting us in glory. Let's...